Um, hello, everyone, and good to see you here. Uh, as you all know, we've um, just had 30th anniversary of the um, Security Council Resolution 688, which was one of the most important decisions uh, regarding Kurdistan and Kurdish people and all the people who live in Kurdistan region. In 1991, millions of Kurds and other residents of Kurdistan left their homes and their belongings and ran away in the mountains and had no friends but the mountains. For the first time after the Second World War, the world has seen such large movement of people and seek a refuge in the mountains in those harsh and cold weathers. European and American leaders were baffled by the inhumanity and all the um, violence were used against the Kurds and peoples of Kurdistan. In Britain, one of the leaders who was pivotal in getting this resolution was John Major. John Major drafted a few ideas and negotiated with the European leaders, especially with France and Germany, and then persuaded Americans to support a resolution which had no backing before. And people thought it was almost impossible to get any um, uh, agreement on it. And for a few reasons, which Gary later on will talk about it. We are pleased to host Gary to talk about what happened in 1991 regarding this resolution and the leadership and courage that John Major took. And rightly, this year in Kurdistan, a, a, an important street in the capital of this city was named after him, after Sir John Major. Uh, Gary is um, a friend of ours and he's also a visiting professor at Soran University. And uh, he is also the director of the UK's old party parliamentary group known as APPG uh, on Kurdistan region. And he has visited Kurdistan and Iraq more than 25 times since 2006. It could be more than that, I think, Gary, you could clarify later on. So uh, Gary will be talking for about 20 minutes about uh, the resolution, but also what happened prior to the resolution and afterwards we could uh, have a lively discussion. You could uh, raise your hands later on or send me the, uh, send me your uh, questions either in Kurdish or in English and I'll read out to Gary later on. So Gary, the floor is yours for 20 minutes and I'm counting the time now. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, unfortunately, not in real life at Saran University. And uh, tomorrow we start uh, to get more freedom and I'm looking forward to going to the barbers because uh, I haven't been for several months and my barber is actually from Howler, uh, just up the road. And um, it's actually 15 years now since uh, I first visited uh, the Kurdistan region, uh, almost exactly. But more important than that, much more important than that is it's 30 years uh, since the events that you've described. And before that, I mean, Clearly, people will remember that there was uh, Halabja and Anfal. And, you know, the idea of discrimination and genocide, uh, second class citizenship for the Kurds seemed endless. It, it, it was as nothing would change this fact. And there's a lovely quote, a line from Seamus Heaney that um, I came across, which I think says everything. Uh, he says, uh, history says, don't hope on this side of the grave, but then, once in a lifetime, the long-for tidal wave of justice rises up and make hope and history rhyme together. And uh, it seems to me that this is what happened in March, uh, February, March 1991, when, you know, just the previous year, Saddam Hussein had foolishly, stupidly, brutally uh, invaded uh, Kuwait and, and this became a great weakness. He was defeated by the Allies very quickly and come the end of February, the beginning of March, uh, he was facing the loss of 14 of 18 uh, Iraqi provinces. 
the Americans made a mistake. They allowed uh, him to use helicopter gunships in the ceasefire terms. And this meant that the Shias who'd risen up, um, there was an appeal from the Americans in particular to do so. The idea they had in mind was a palace coup, a so-called one bullet policy uh, to replace Saddam with somebody else and keep Iraq together. And the Kurds rose up in a more planned way on the 5th of March. But using the helicopter gunships, Saddam was able to crush the rebellion in the south and the key Kurds were in retreat. Kirkuk had been taken, but was uh, taken back by his forces. And as you said, two million uh, fled to the mountains. Now, the difference, though, between uh, Anfal, Halabja, and now, Anfal and Halabja are in the middle of the fog of war. I mean, the Iran-Iraq war. And it was very difficult to get there, to get information. This time, the cameras were there. MPs went there. Uh, there was a lot of horror. There was a lot of anger. And uh, I remember I did a history on this for Kurdistan 24. And um, I was looking at the Commons debates and there was uh, a Conservative MP, Julian Amory. He was then a Tory grandee. He'd been around for many years. I met him in the 80s in Brighton, where I lived when I was on the other side. And he was passionate about the need for uh, the UK and its allies to intervene with or without the UN. And I mentioned him because his, his father had been the British colonial secretary in the 20s and had saluted the RAF's bombing of the Kurds in 1922 to 25 and that it was good training. Remember, the RAF was a new force uh, after the First World War. Uh, I mean, other people who spoke very passionately, uh, Anne Cluid, who's uh, no longer an MP, but she spent five days on the mountains uh, with the Kurds and she, she held the commons in thrall because she described what was going on. And, and I know that there was a lot of uh, Kurdish lobbying. Uh, Iraqi embassies were occupied and people like um, Safin Dizaye and Hoshia Zabari and uh, Nadim Zahawi and Baham Sali were on TV screens. Public opinion was really, really horrified by what it was seeing. And um, I mean, this is when I had my own first very small involvement with Kurdistan because the main organization here was the British Aid for the Kurds. And um, you know, people were donating blankets and uh, food and medicines. And it's a long time back and I don't remember the details exactly, but they got in touch with the MP that I worked for. Uh, we met, we talked, we helped them. And somehow or another, um, I remember we persuaded Iran to send a 747 to collect uh, these uh, provisions and send them over. Uh, something like 1100 tons of um, provisions were collected uh, in the UK. And I think that shows really just how enormous the outpouring of sympathy, solidarity uh, with the Kurds actually was. So combined with all the Kurdish lobby, very effective. I mean, Dalara Alaldin tells how he met um, Mrs. Thatcher on the 3rd of April, and then she lobbied John Major, she lobbied J uh, President Bush, he sent James Baker, the Secretary of State, uh, to the Turkish border. All these things were bubbling up. Now, the normal response at that time would be to have a series of warm words. This is terrible, it shouldn't happen. Uh, yes, we can send aid, um, but this is an internal Iraqi affair. Um, Lara, you mentioned UN Security Council Resolution 688. I don't think it was quite as important. It was not unimportant. Uh, but if you read the resolution, it's very much about maintaining the territorial sovereignty of Iraq. This is what the UN does and says. It doesn't really say that anything should be done about it. And I think, you know, what was extraordinary was, as I say, the normal response is to not take action. And uh, I pointed out 
we had a webinar with Sir John Major, he liked this, uh, that uh, I looked up what was number one in the British uh, music charts at the time. And it was a song by The Clash uh, called Should I Stay or Should I Go? And that was really the question <laughs> that a lot of people in Britain and America were asking. So you've got to remember that Saddam had invaded Kuwait in August 1990. The campaign had been short. Uh, the Americans were facing their own elections and there was a pressure on them to bring the boys home because the American public, the British public, didn't want our boys, our troops to stay any longer than necessary. But this clashed uh, with this humanitarian outpouring. So the political dilemma wasn't there. But it also found a prime minister who'd only been in the post since uh, November 1990, uh, when Mrs. Sasha was forced out. And he was horrified. And I've quoted from his autobiography. He, he says that he, he just saw the misery and he knew that uh, genocide was in Saddam's mind. It'd been in his character. And the surprise, um, looking back, was that he did something really quite unusual. He was the quiet revolutionary who defied the norms of international relations. And so what really happened in just a very short time was, uh, so if you look at the timeline, uh, the uprising uh, starting in Rania was on the 5th of March. On the 21st of March, as you know, obviously, uh, Neuros, uh, Kurdish New Year, uh, John Major took the issue to his cabinet. On the 5th of April, uh, there was UN Security Council Resolution 688. And on the 8th of April, there was a European Council of Ministers, European Union's um, governing body. And he had decided on this policy of a safe haven and no fly zone. This was not, this was novel. I mean, it hadn't been done before. And he persuaded France, um, I think they were keen because they realized that America wasn't. <laughs> but anyway, that's just the normal Franco-American thing. And he persuaded Germany. So by the 8th of April, he had a proposal. It was all done in a great hurry. And it was passed by the European Council. He then persuaded uh, George Bush Sr. to go along with it. And roughly 12th 13th of april so you're talking about four or five weeks on from the uprising uh, you had the no-fly zone and the safe haven which were then in operation for 12 years i mean france left after a few years but it was in operation nadim sahawi pointed out on our webinar the other day that there was something like 28,000 sorties uh, operations air operations to defend this and um, it's clear that uh, if that hadn't happened, then genocide would have been inflicted on the Kurds. Uh, hundreds of thousands would have stayed in Turkey and Iran. Um, there would be fewer Kurds. Kurds would have been killed in large numbers. Uh, the Kurdistan regional government would not exist. Uh, the Kurdistan region would not be in, it would not exist at least in the form that it is now. Uh, that it wouldn't have been able to play a positive role in stabilizing Iraq uh, after the liberation in 2003, that it wouldn't have been able to be the main um, opponent, the main resistance to Daesh uh, in uh, 2014. And it was, you know, I think it's been forgotten how important this was. I mean, if I'm honest with you, I mean, I had this small involvement. I then got very involved and many years later. But until I did the history, I hadn't realized quite how much had been put into getting this policy by John Major. And, you know, he took a great risk. And he says in his uh, autobiography, yes, it could have been embarrassing. But so what? It had been embarrassing. But, you know, the greater thing would be that thousands, hundreds of thousands of Kurds would have died. And I was very pleased that um, the KRG uh, has decided decided to um, uh, name the street after Sir John Major. And he said at our webinar that he, he was very flattered and he looked forward to being able to go there. 
I mean, I know for years that I have seen a uh, place Francois Mitterrand in a uh, bill. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very pro French and uh, the France uh, and the, the people who supported the Kurds, Danielle Mitterrand, Bernard Kushner and others, you know, played a really important role. I don't want to take away from that at all. But I've sort of often thought that, you know, there should be something else as well. Uh, and so it's a richly deserved award. And uh, just on a personal note, uh, it, what's a little ironic is that when I first went there, uh, I was a guest of the uh, unions, the syndicates there. And every day we used to go for our evening meal at the Howler restaurant, which is on Sir John Major Street. And I hadn't quite realized the, the circularity of it. And I very much hope that, um, you know, the, the understanding of what the UK did uh, and how it got France and then America to support it will do a lot to boost uh, relations between the UK and Kurdistan. I, and I'm saying here that we should be very, very proud of what happened. It was a revolutionary thing to do. And, um, you know, the Middle East would just be much worse off if Sir John Major hadn't done something unusual, taken the risk and, um, you know, saving the Kurds uh, and saving the Kurdistan region. And, and that's just a brief introduction. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gary. As always, um, very informative. And I think um, with the questions that we have in a minute, um, uh, the debate will uh, be more lively. Uh, what's important, uh, as you mentioned, uh, at the beginning, the resolution 688 wasn't uh, to be what it, it was, how it, it evolved. Uh, it was something to prevent human humanitarian disaster, prevent Kurds from another genocide. And yet afterwards became a political uh, matter. And then the no-fly zone was created in south of Iraq and north of Iraq. And in the north of Iraq, then the Kurds managed to take their own affairs after the regime withdrew their troops and their administration. And Saddam said that in this way, he will punish the Kurds. The Kurds have no way to manage themselves and then they will beg him to come back. But it didn't happen. It evolved to something, you know, 28 years after that, we held a referendum for independence and it could may be a foundation uh, this decision could it could be foundation for future Kurdish independence in the region, uh, and also for somebody like John Major back then to take such decision as you pointed out from his autobiography. He said it was a risk and it could have been an embarrassment, and he feared that. But he more feared that if there if, if it's going to be an embarrassment, then it's going to be devastation for the Kurds. Thank God that didn't happen. And thank God we had leadership back then in such difficult times. Um, the importance of that decision, now we, when we look back, we, we realize how brave John Major and other leaders were because the, UN, the former UN security um, uh, the head of UN Security Council said the decision was illegal, but yet people supported it. So that's why when, when you see the context, when you read everything within the context, you know how important the decision was uh, and how the role of uh, John Major and other leaders were pivotal in getting the re resolution passed. Uh, anyway, I'll open the discussion for our attendees. If anyone has a question, they could either send the question to me directly in Kurdish or in English or raise their hands. They could ask and let me know. Um, so far, we have a few questions, one of which is, uh, is, the re is the reason remaining Kurdistan stateless as a, as a biggest nation in the world their fault or the uh, other factors you could yeah, okay uh, i mean um, yeah this often comes up so i remember at the very beginning uh, of i think it's about 31 visits to kurdistan region and a couple to baghdad 
uh, we used to meet um, Kurdistani leaders and, uh, you know, they would almost, they would very quickly start talking about Sykes-Picot uh, in 1916. And I think that uh, in the end, Sykes-Picot didn't happen in the form that was envisaged. Um, but what did happen was that there was an Anglo-French carve up of the Middle East into spheres of influence. And I mean, I've written many times that the Middle East was was seen as a petrol pump. I mean, the Royal Navy had, ch had turned from coal to oil to fire to fuel the Royal Navy in 1912. And clearly a source of oil was necessary. Um, parts of the left, when it came to the 2003 war, they, they kept saying that this was no blood for oil. I mean, without seeming to realize that Saddam Hussein would have sold oil to anybody. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't any problem about that. Um, now, I think the problem with that uh, the Sykes-Picot um, uh, analysis here is that there were other reasons why uh, the Kurds uh, were unable or failed uh, to um, create a single state out of what is now uh, Kurdish areas of uh, Syria and um, Turkey and Iran and Iraq. And it, it wasn't simply that they were denied, it's that they were divided and uh, relatively weak and others were stronger. And that moment, it seems, um, went. And you know whether or not it ever comes back, you know, it's not for me. I'm not a Kurd. I mean, it's not for me to impose that on you. But uh, it seems to me that from what I've talked to many uh, Kurdish people over the years about this is uh, never say never. It's a dream, but it seems to be highly unlikely. Uh, what is um, and and you know the the Kurdish leaderships in. Uh, Rojava, Rojalat and uh, in Turkey uh, don't talk about uh, one single Kurdistan. They talk about Kurdish rights and, and the need for uh, autonomy, some form of federalism, language rights, political rights and so on. Uh, the only internationally recognized region is, of course, the Kurdistan region, thanks to the events of 1991. And uh, next year we'll see the 30th anniversary of the formation of of the elections and then the formation of the coalition government and the KRG. And it's um, more likely uh, that if an independence is to come, then it would happen in the Kurdistan uh, region of Iraq. Um, it's not an issue at the moment, but you never know <laughs> quite when an issue. I was there for the referendum, so I mean, I'm very well aware that 93% uh, voted in 72% uh, turnout. I was in Erbil, Haule and uh, Kirkuk and Sully as an observer on, on the day. In the meantime, that's not the issue. I mean, I think that uh, the COVID has enormous consequences um, because mainly because it, it, it led to the you know, huge reduction in world economic activity, uh, demand for oil went down massively and um, I think what's come out the other end is the realization that you can't rely on oil for 90% of your revenues 90 or more uh, and that there has to be much greater diversification I will say you see the Kurdish flag there the sun in the middle that's that could be quite important <laughs> in generating uh, new revenues and new energy so um, Yes, I think the, the crucial thing is uh, at the moment for there to be the best possible deal with Baghdad. I'm relatively pleased with what's happened uh, in the last uh, week or so, um, but it's difficult. Uh, I, I have some time for the prime minister. Yeah, uh, he's sure. not the only one um, with a view. Should we put it as diplomatically as that? <laughs> Uh, we have another question from Rebas Salim. Uh, he asks whether this resolution is still in, in, uh, intact or has the resolution expired altogether? Uh, I don't know technically. I mean, I think it's still intact. Um, but I mean, it was a very specific resolution. I mean, about uh, it talks about the recent attacks on uh, Iraqi civilians, especially in the Kurdish areas. And I think the importance of the resolution was that um, as the years went by, uh, British ministers, uh, both Conservative and then Labour, were asked about the legitimacy of the uh, safe haven and the no-fly zone. And they, they, they used, 
they, they said that there was a humanitarian catastrophe about to happen and that and the Security Council resolution legitimized it. So it, it's not relevant at the moment, but um, I think the important thing about the safe haven was that uh, this was the beginning of the end for the idea that dictators could do whatever they liked in their own countries. Now, a long time back, there used to be a sort of common attitude by the police here and elsewhere that domestic violence was a private matter and that you shouldn't really intervene. Well, that was the case with um, genocides and atrocities in sovereign countries. And I think what we saw really is that John Major's actions were the beginnings of the development of a doctrine uh, known as the responsibility to protect that the UN has adopted. It's still in its infancy. Uh, it's not quite clear, but remembered also that the 90s saw uh, military intervention in the Yugoslav civil war. And uh, clearly you had ethnic cleansing, concentration camps, and these were not seen as um, uh, an internal matter. You also saw very sadly the weakness of the UN. If you ever get round to watching the film Srebrenica, it's very moving. And, uh, you know, uh, I think I'm right in saying it was uh, 8,000 men and boys were taken away and um, executed uh, okay. under the eyes of the UN. We also have Rwanda and the Republic of Congo. Yes. Uh, yeah. These are different matters. We have another question, and um, that is, uh, let me read in Kurdish and translate it. So, uh, what the future holds for the Kurds now after 30 years of this resolution? Well, that's up to you, not me. <laughs> I mean, um, it seems to me that. Uh, uh, as I was saying, I mean, COVID will be over uh, at some point. Uh, you have to, in my view, uh, further accelerate the diversification of the economy. Uh, you have uh, plentiful agriculture. Uh, tourism can return. Um, I often try to encourage people to uh, go to Kurdistan. Um, when they hear the word Iraq, they're a little worried. But, uh, you know, frankly, I've been there so often and know that it's a lot safer most of the time uh, than it is in London yeah, and um, you need uh, light industry I think there's a very strong case for um, look if, let's put it bluntly I mean in 1991 I mean the, the Kurds were saved set up their own administration and then there was one university and now I think I'm right in saying there are 41 universities uh, in Kurdistan uh, region. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the level of those universities uh, uh, have to be improved. Um, we're talking about a new economy. We're talking about uh, graduates who can make their contribution to the new economy uh, after COVID and as carbons fade, it won't disappear. But uh, if the price is too low, then it'd be difficult to get them out of the ground. And you don't need to rely on it so much. And uh, so, so there's a need for the modernization of education, of higher education and um, thoroughgoing reform to diversify revenue and also to encourage, um, you know, a, a more vibrant civil society, trade unions, uh, women's groups, uh, environmental groups. I mean, I know that the environment is seen as a, a, a bigger and bigger issue. Um, if I'm honest, I, I, I love Kurdistan, but I, I find it difficult sometimes to see the beautiful sites with Rawandus or Gali Ali Beg and all the litter. <laughs> this has got to stop. And um, so I think the there are a lot of people of a younger age who are really moved by that and, you know, growing trees and uh, really getting agriculture back up in order. I know the villages were destroyed uh, by Anfal, um, but working in the countryside, um, attracting mass tourism from the West, these are really important things that could be very good for the people doing them and very good for revenues. So it's in your hands is what I'm saying. Thanks, Gary. Uh, we have another question um, asking how important, uh, 
It says, how important was Kurdish lobbying back then in Europe uh, and also Kurdish demonstrations and Kurds taking over emb uh, Iraqi embassies and consulates all over capital cities in Europe? Yes, I think I think it was very important, and uh, I've I've looked at some of the footage of uh, very young Safin Desaye, very young Nadim Zahawi, mm -hmm. and they talked. To, we we talked about this at the webinar we had with Sir John Major. Uh, Kak Safin was uh, very moving uh, because he said that um, two Kurdish activists who'd occupied uh, the Iraqi embassy uh, were then taken to court, and uh, the judge said. Uh, you know, they explained why, and he was very moved by this. And he said, he, he let them go. He said, don't, 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 don't do it again, but he let them go. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, in that case, you had, uh, you had the Kurdish front at home, uh, coordinating clearly the, uh, the military resistance to Saddam, the big battle at Kore, I think. And uh, here, uh, you had people who then went on to become important leaders who did things that went hand in hand with the outpouring of anger that there was uh, in, in the British public. So all these things came together. And, you know, I hope that we never have to deal with something like this. But if we do, uh, then, you know, the unity of uh, the Kurdish lobby at home and here uh, the role of the diaspora, um, making sure that we understand what's happening through good media and mobilizing MPs of all parties, as well as having a government that's sympathetic, are going to be essential as in 1991. So, yes, I mean, what Kurdistani people did here was vital. And I think what it did is that, um, you know, the, the UK Consul General uh, was on the webinar and was explaining that uh, the diplomatic representation of the UK is bigger in the Kurdistan region than it is in many countries. Uh, and this seems odd because the, the Kurdistan region is a sub-sovereign entity, but it's not just a sub-sovereign entity. It is not just another region. It's not a nation. Uh, I'd say it's a near nation, perhaps. But the thing is that... Um, it is seen as very important, both to Iraq and is at the center of the Middle East. And I think that people appreciate that uh, it has an ability to um, spread values. It's become a safe haven for religious groups and minorities. It has democratic aspirations uh, that are very important. It's played a very good role in mediating with uh, the neighbours. Look, when I went there for the first time, there were always the same things I heard. I mean, the critique of Sykes-Picot, uh, we have no friends but the mountains. John Major disproved that. That was a great thing to have done. Uh, it's a tough neighbourhood. And uh, so, and people talk about uh, how Kurdistan is the only landlocked uh, country in the world surrounded by sharks and and the neighbors have at different points in history been also known as the wolves have played a very negative role and you, the, the final one is that uh, we choose we, we can't choose our neighbors but we do choose our friends and it seemed to me that the meaning of 1991 is it put Kurdistan region into British foreign policy in a much bigger way and I hope that um, you know, the relationship between the Kurdistan region and the UK, which is pretty strong, can get bigger. I mean, we have to wait until life gets back to normal. And, um, you know, that, I don't know how long that's going to take. And then we can start, you know, flying here and there. And I hope that there'll be a trade mission, for instance, because I know there are a lot of, there's a lot of uh, affection for and respect for British uh, services and goods. And I want more and more businesses and public institutions to go there for, for their benefit, but also for the benefit of the Kurdistani people. Yeah, we have, thank you. And we have another question from Saman Saleh. If I may rephrase the question, um, um, why the UK did not make any decision while Saddam Hussein was uh, waging uh, wars and genocide upon Kurds prior to 1991, but 
1991, they rushed to get the um, resolution 6888. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are many reasons. I mean, I think that the other thing that's uh, really important to remember is that um, world politics changed in 1990, 91 anyway, uh, with the end of the Cold War. Um, and before that, I mean, a lot of countries were judged uh, by what role they would play uh, in the uh, ideological and economic competition between the Soviet Union and uh, the US, the West. And Iraq was sometimes supported by the Soviet Union, sometimes supported by America, but its, it's utility, if you like, in realpolitik was about that. That started to change in 1990. I, I don't really want to get into why governments didn't do things. I mean, uh, I felt that it was wrong, for instance, um, that um, it was business as usual after Halabja that there was British participation in the Baghdad arms fair. We raised this in the debate that we had uh, eight years ago when the UK Parliament uh, formally recognised the ANFAL. And I think the minister then, Alistair Burt, a good man, um, said that, you know, he felt that that was wrong to have gone ahead with that. This was another era. It's, I'm not responsible for it. Uh, I'm not necessarily in the same party uh, that did this. But I, 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 I think that the important thing is that, um, you know, we, we learn lessons. And um, I think that uh, the, the great thing is that in the end, I mean, um, you know, we had the safe haven. And uh, I mean, you can go back in history and you can look at all the, the bad things that have been done. I would probably agree with you, but I really want to focus on the positive thing that came out in 91 and, and how we can build on that uh, now. Um, thanks, Gary. Um, something came to my mind and a few days ago i interviewed Lau and i've been live on tv and he mentioned he met margaret thatcher and when he left uh, the room uh, margaret thatcher's secretary asked him to stay just behind the doors asked him to stay because margaret thatcher called john major straight away and they discussed uh, the matter and also they discussed how this um, decision to bring the issue to the parliament and later on to the Security Council is important for the Kurds, for them, uh, for, for humanity, but also for the Conservative Party, because back then they were in trouble. They were losing votes. Um, so they tried um, to bring the issue to the parliament because they, they knew they had support from all parties, especially from the opposite, uh, the, the Labour Party. Back then, I don't know whether you were in the parliament or not, and whether you were aware of the, the, the internal tension, but how the, both parties were united on this matter. So you could describe that a little bit for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that um, John Major refers to the meeting he had. Uh, so I know about the meeting that he had with, uh, that she had with Dalawa and a very young ranch uh, and others, uh, all in Kurdish dress. Uh, on the 3rd of April. Uh, he refers to the lobbying that Mrs. Sasha then made to him and said that uh, she wasn't aware that they already had plans in hand and that they there was a paper that was prepared the previous week at the Foreign Office and uh, that it was already in hand. Now, I, I mean, he's very polite about this. Um, I, I think it was important that um, it was good that Mrs. Thatcher, the former prime minister, uh, was doing this and then talked, uh, as I said before, to the Americans. Um, I don't really remember now. Uh, I, I was in Parliament since 87, still am. I don't particularly remember those circumstances uh, in detail. Um, I, I suspect that, um, yeah, I mean, there was an election uh, a year later in 92. So, and clearly, uh, I'm guessing here, you know, uh, the state of public opinion is always going to be a factor. And it was very clear that public opinion was very angry about this. And there were lots of big changes taking place at the time because, I mean, another one, uh, there'd been something called the poll tax, uh, which was very unpopular. 
And uh, I mean, I was very heavily involved in the campaign on the issue. And, uh, you know, Conservative MPs, all MPs, I mean, they, they look at the size of their majority, they look at the letters they're getting, they can guess how many people think the same and they can they can work out for themselves that sooner or later this is going to threaten their majorities. My guess, therefore, is that the scale of uh, horror uh, and outrage uh, was seen as a factor. Um, it always is on different issues. I mean, I'm just relieved that uh, there was such widespread support uh, for uh, the safe havens policy and that it lasted so long. Mm -hmm. um, other um, things happened back then. Lots of um, humanitarian organizations uh, collected money and donations for the Kurds and sent clothes medicine and came to help and live concerts were held in European cities to collect donations for the matter. So it was a, it was a huge, huge moment. And I think perhaps it was the first time that the European and uh, Europeans became aware of Kurdish plight in, in a great number. Uh, so um, London and Britain was the home and, 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 and the backbone, if you like, of the, of the movement. And tell us a little bit about these organizations like Safe Haven, like Oxfam, like Bridge Aid, uh, Save the Children, those uh, and, and how, uh, and their role and what roles they played in, in um, during that period. Yeah, I mean, the organizer in the West Country of British Aid for the Kurds got in touch and there was a, a lot of, um, there were logistical difficulties and, and there were complaints about what the government was or wasn't doing. Uh, I mean, I think that in response to lobbying from uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, millions of pounds of AIDS were sent uh, to the Kurds. Um, but it didn't seem enough and there were problems in, in doing so. Um, I mean, the other thing is that with the demonstrations, um, I came across, there was a demonstration in Glasgow, uh, Scottish solidarity with the Kurds, and um, it was something like 400 people. Now, Glasgow's a city, but 400 is a good number for a demonstration in a, a relatively small city of the UK. And the remarkable thing was that uh, the organiser of this demonstration read out a message from John Major to the demonstration uh, saying he couldn't be with you, couldn't, sorry, he couldn't be there, but wished you well. And, uh, you know, he wasn't going to stand by and see uh, Saddam kill his own people. Now, I mention that because, how should I put this? I mean, it's fairly unusual uh, for prime ministers and, and perhaps more so conservative prime ministers to send messages of support to a demonstration. It, it, and I think that that little incident uh, tells you something about how powerfully passionate uh, people had become about the plight of the Kurdish people. And it was shocking. Um, I mean, uh, the Prime Minister Masrur Barzani um, at the webinar uh, went out of his way to praise uh, the work of Jim Muir, uh, mm. the BBC correspondent. And I know that if you go to uh, the Red House in Sulaymaniyya, I think I'm right in saying there's a loop of the BBC's reports from Jim Muir and Charles Wheeler. And, and they are uh, very, I mean, the, the, the journalists who went there, and, and there were some risks, uh, did tremendous job in drawing this to our attention. So although it's a long time back, and I haven't gone into all the details of uh, all the problems and what exactly happened. What I have established is that, um, that there was an outpouring and there was a remarkable and surprising uh, response because nobody would have seen this coming. It was just not part of the, the times that we lived in. And it was, as I say, it was, it was a dramatic and revolutionary break from, I mean, what I was describing earlier is essentially realpolitik, which is that you deal with the regime so that there you look after your own interests, you don't have friends. This was the viewpoint of Lord Palmerston, 
who I quoted in the webinar with John Major, who, who said uh, that uh, England, by which he means uh, the UK, um, should have only perpetual interests, not perpetual allies. In other words, we just look after ourselves and people come and go. Now that, in a sense, was the fate of the Kurds for a large part of the 20th century during the Cold War, is that the Kurds were seen as pawns uh, uh, by the great powers. This time it seemed to me that um, something dramatic changed because the old politics didn't apply and the Kurds were not abandoned they found other friends and uh, I, you know the consequences of that are very obvious uh, thanks very much Gary I think we have no more questions um, but uh, just uh, while you were talking about uh, Jim Muir Patrick Cogborn came to my mind. He also wrote a few pieces back then, and I think he visited refugees in the mountains. Uh, I could be wrong on that. But I, oh, think, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, he was another good journalist who wrote for The Independent uh, back then. Um, very good. So um, I think uh, we are coming to the end. So if you have any final remarks on that. No, I mean, I think I've said it all uh, that I want to say. I mean, I'm very pleased that this this alliance of, uh, you know, Kurdish resistance at home, and, and what I want to do is to pay tribute to all those who, you know, took on Saddam Hussein. This is not an easy thing to do, obviously, and uh, in a coordinated fashion between uh, the main parties. And, um, and it was successful to start. Uh, and... There was some glorious resistance and and yet of course you had uh, people flee into the mountains and the stories i've heard are terrible uh people freezing and having either to go back to death or to take the risk of jumping off the mountain i know that happened i've heard it and um but in the end i mean you know what then happened was a revolutionary uh decision was taken to set up the safe haven you referred at the beginning, Kaknara, to uh, the this is the biggest movement of refugees since the Second World War, and that's true. But the return of those refugees uh, from the mountains, from Turkey and Iran, was also the biggest since the Second World War. And then you had people who'd been in Iran and Turkey for much, much longer, I mean, since the 70s. And then you had uh, the return of people from the UK, Sweden. I remember in 2006, people were saying, well, the, the KRG was divided between the English faction and the Swedish faction, depending on where you'd been. And, um, and clearly, uh, people feeling safe uh, in their own uh, land and people then returning has been one of the factors that the, the 90s were clearly a bleak time. I mean, you, you had double sanctions uh, from Saddam, and you're right that he, he thought that the Kurds would be begging for him to return. I mean, he, he did do things as well. He nearly killed Daniel Mitterrand, I think, in 92. Uh, and his forces were, you know, sort of not entirely absent. They went in uh, as and when they could. But um, then, of course, there was a civil war, and, and that was uh, terrible. All civil wars are and that was brokered the end of that was brokered in 98 but despite you know the sanctions from Saddam the sanctions from the UN uh the uh civil war the lack of money you know so much was achieved I mean I think that I'm right in saying that uh, if you look at infant mortality rates in Kurdistan compared to Iraq in that period they were higher in uh sorry lower <laughs> lower in the Kurdistan uh region and uh, so that showed an ability, despite everything, to get things done. And as I say, you know, one university has become 41. And I think that this, um, I, I quoted another Irish figure uh, in a different context altogether about a decision that uh, enabled, uh, gave the freedom to achieve freedom. And um, I'm also very, I remember very clearly being <clears throat> in Howlair for the first time and going to Sami Abdul Rahman Park and the you know the monument there to the hundred people who were murdered on uh, I think the 2nd of February 2004 is freedom is not free so if you don't mind let me be let me make that the sort of final sort of conclusion 
freedom is not free. Thankfully, uh, freedom was assisted this time uh, by the UK and France and America, and we are all of us uh, better off. And uh, as I said, you know, we I very much hope as I'm the secretary of the All Party Parliamentary Group. I very much hope that uh, we can build on our relationship and. What I said at the end of my contribution was, as they say in Kurdistan, uh, Barbroin, uh, let's get on with it. Uh, and I look forward to coming back and meeting everybody in person for the first time in so long. So, uh, so, so, Thank you, Gary. And hope this COVID madness will be over soon. I will host another meeting here for you at Soran University, as always. Um, it's a pleasure to have you. And it was a very lively discussion and very important and very informative um, and I hope uh, uh, Kakem and uh, we can publish that later on and disseminate the seminar more widely with other groups that you and I are members and yes. also in Kurdish media because sure. that was very important and Gary as always uh, thanks very much you've been working on that on that uh, matter writing for the Kurdistan 24 but also um, participating in a webinar with the Prime Minister, Masroor Barzani and uh, John Major, uh, with a few other um, wonderful um, people from the UK Parliament and the government. Thanks very much and stay safe and stay well. Okay, oh, okay, thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Well, See ya, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.